Thank you. It's great to be here and hello people on Zoom. Uh, yeah, speak up on Zoom if you have any if you have any questions or something you don't understand. Yeah. So yeah, so I think if uh, I'm not planning to stay here to, 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 to talk <laughs> until 12:30, but that means that we have more time for questions than I think. Uh, so this is a talk about mechanism design and kind of uh, the big picture here is that we want uh, to take traditional algorithm design, which assumes that we have an input and there is an output. So that's algorithm design and uh, uh, convert it into a mechanism. So a mechanism assumes that the inputs are not given to us, but they have to come from somewhere. They come from some agents who have their own agenda and the output translates into an outcome that whoever produces the input cares about. So the picture is more complicated because now, be, uh, in addition to solving potentially the combinatorial or the analytical problem here, we also need to worry about getting the correct inputs and kind of inducing good behavior from the entire system. And there are tons of examples of how good algorithms can turn into really bad mechanisms. Uh, so th that's the mechanism design agenda. And algorithmic mechanism design uh, as a field uh, tries to, to, I mean, at least part of the agenda is coming up with good mechanisms. Uh, how much, understanding how much of an effect is this additional having to worry about uh, it being a mechanism, uh, having to worry about agents reporting how much uh, of an extra condition it is. In particular, one kind of of the dreams of the field is a generic reduction that takes an algorithm and says, I got it. Here's a mechanism that is functionally identical. It's known that it's not always possible, but uh, at least that's, that's a good thing to have. Uh, as as a as a little kind of goal for what to keep track of what the field is trying to do. Um, so what is a reduction? So uh, in many cases, so in many specific cases like auctions, actually what you get is a non-reduction. You just get a different solution for the same problem. So for example. An auction is a simple maximization function, but when it turned into an optimal auction, kind of Meyerson style, it's a complicated linear program to solve the same thing. But so that's that's definitely one thing we can always do. Another kind of extreme is a black box reduction where you have a box for the algorithm and you turn it into a mechanism. We'll see some of those. There is an open box reduction where you modify an algorithm in a prescribed way. And one reason, so you'd think that black box reductions are better whenever possible, but it's actually, I'm not sure it's true anymore because uh, a lot of the algorithms that we end up using in practice are actually heuristics. And it seems very dangerous to treat the heuristic as a black box, but you can hope that you can somehow, and today's talk and the, the work was in part motivated by this, by realizing that modern algorithms, a lot of them are heuristic. Sometimes people don't know why they work. In the case of machine learning, sometimes it's not that they don't know, it's, it's uh, some kind of a control system where, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, there are many reasons why it's uh, why why what we get at the end is, is is heuristic. So it's it's good to have something that works together, modifies the algorithm in a way that can extend to heuristics or to poorly defined uh, objectives. So today we'll uh, work on uh, developing an open white box framework for iterated optimization based algorithms for the situation without money. Um, and in general, algorithm mechanisms without money are more challenging than mechanisms with money. Uh, and uh, examples of important settings of mechanisms without money that you probably, some of them you probably have heard of, social choice like voting, 
uh, matching, like school choice, and two-sided matching. So in the style of Gail Shapley, are examples of mechanisms or algorithms that induce mechanisms without money. And uh, so the, we will start with, uh, with discussing some ingredients. Those are probably, uh, so there is a very nice three-way connection between optimization, online learning, and the correlated equilibrium game theory. At least for every pair of those, there is probably like a textbook or a seminal paper, but really those are it depending in the literature, depending on where you are, you use one language, but uh, many of the times you could pretend like you're solving, you're, when solving an LP, you could pretend like you're playing some game with, with a barrier. So there is a very nice three-way connection, and we'll use those connections to talk about the new generic reduction. Uh, additionally, there are two important ingredients or three, three ingredients. So this is, if you've seen uh, mechanism design, this is a review. Otherwise, this is perhaps one of the most important concepts uh, that I think this is uh, something, uh, the VCG mechanism got a Nobel Prize. Um, correlated equilibria from repeated plays. So it's basically the, uh, the connection on the previous slide between uh, optimi online optimization and uh, correlated equilibrium game theory. And a relatively new ingredient from the last 10 years is an extension of very classical online learning concepts with bandits, but now something called bandits with knapsacks. And this, this, those two, this is kind of 70s. This is, I mean, depends how you count, also pretty well understood and pretty old. This is relatively new, maybe from the last 10 years. Uh, and I won't have many references there in the paper. Uh, it's just, uh, the, there is more of a review there. So this is very classical. Uh, it's a reduction. So we are gonna talk about reductions today. So this is a reduction that almost does what we want, except it doesn't, there are many reasons why you can't use it in practice. Uh, it's a reduction from perfect optimization to mechanisms with money with very nice properties. So this is the VCG mechanism. It can be summarized in a simple sentence, maximize utility, make the world as happy as possible, and charge each player their externality. So what is externality? The externality cost play by player I is how much loss of utility having to uh, account, accommodate them causes to the rest of the system. So that's, uh, that's the mechanism. And formally, let's say we have utility functions from some space X. This will be kind of the space throughout the talk that uh, for every point X gives you uh, how happy player I would be. So the units here, it's important. So this is the units here are money units because we are gonna charge the money. Later in mechanism without money, unfortunately we have to deal with unit free functions, but here the units are dollars or whatever currency we are using. And so the mechanism outputs the maximum, uh, the X that maximizes total happiness and player I is charged this expression, which is if you parse it, so this is how happy the rest of the players would be if they didn't need to worry about player I. So maximize overall Y, the sum of happiness is without that player. And this is how happy they are in practice. So PI is the externality, is the difference between those two. Assuming all deaths are non-negative, it's easy to see that this is always non-negative. And uh, the standard example, at least to see that we recover something sane in cases where we didn't need all this machinery is uh, the standard auction. We need to auction off one item among n players. So the outcome space here is a discrete space one through n, where uh, point i says player i gets the item. And the utility of player i for outcome j is zero if they don't get the item and vi if they do. So it's uh, one i equals to j times vi. Okay, so how do you maximize happiness? You give it to the person who wants it the most, so the outcome 
uh, is to give it to the highest value player. And what do they charge? What do you charge them? You charge zero from everyone else because they don't change the outcome. And you what do you charge from the player who won the item? The second highest value, because that's how happy the world would be if we didn't have to give the item to player I, we would give it to the second highest bidder. So you recovered the second price auction, which is truthful. Um, okay, I didn't define what truthful means, but in second price auction, at least if you trust the setup, there is no reason for you to misrepresent your, uh, your utility. So it's truthful, not just in the second price case, but it's always truthful. So reporting the true utility FI is a dominant strategy for player I, regardless of what everyone else bids. So you can't benefit, you can't get a better outcome by reporting some of J FI tilde instead of FI. It always leads to the optimal outcome. It's literally the first line. And, uh, it's completely general. We made no assumptions about anything. It doesn't need to be convex. I mean, we assume that we know how to solve the maximization problem, but somehow uh, that's fine. It's a reduction, so we have to assume that. So some of the drawbacks, well, it requires money. So that's not a major drawback because in many setups you do have money, but if you want mechanism without money, that's a drawback for us. This is another kind of uh, drawback. If you think about complicated setups, you need an explicit knowledge about utility. And, and if you turn it into an iterated algorithm where you, like, for example, let's say that the most naive thing you can try to do is to run gradient descent, that's already not potentially not truthful at all because it becomes a very complicated game. The most important failure is that in a large system, this is com a completely crazy mechanism. So it completely doesn't work. And okay, so here is one failure mode. So it fails under approximations and heuristics because imagine we are trying to, there are thousands of players. So those two numbers are huge. And now imagine that instead of a perfect optimization, we have an approximate optimization. So let's say this is a billion, this is a billion. This is supposed to be on the scale of a thousand because there are millions of players. And we have an excellent heuristic that gets us within 99.9% .9 of optimal. So this is correct up to a million. This is correct up to a million. This is correct up to a million, but it's supposed to be on a scale of thousands. And that's, that's a, one example of a problem with that. Um, and yeah, it's, it, there are other problems that are like that, but basically, the reason, the philosophical reason is that, that you're basically selling, it's called selling the business to player I. You basically tell each player I in the setup is treated like, okay, it's your job to make the world happy and do it the best you can and keep the difference. Basically, that's that's one way to view it. And because uh, because of that, it's, it's, uh, it's completely not compatible. That's... Not the official reason, but in a nutshell, that's the reason why it's supposed to solve mechanism design, but it's rarely used in practice. So this is very noisy. Okay, second reduction, something completely different. Now it's, uh, it's going to talk about correlated equilibria. And so in the context of strategic games, a Nash equilibrium is a distribution of actions such that no player has an incentive to deviate. It is a solution concept, so it's not a prescription or a prediction of what's going to happen, and uh, but it's it's a plot device of some kind to understand games. And epsilon Nash means that no player derives too much benefit from deviating, and those are conceptually difficult to reason about. So, we, for example, we know that they're computationally hard to find, but also. It's beyond just computationally hard to find. It's not clear how to get a handle on them. So imagine you never heard of game theory. Uh, so in practice, I would like to argue that most of what we see are correlated equilibria. And correlated equilibria, uh, OK, so conceptually, it's almost maybe a, a historic accident that they were discovered later than Nash equilibria. Uh, 
So a correlated equilibrium is each player observes an additional signal without loss of generality. It could be the proposed action of what to do, but it could be, in general, it could be market prices, traffic signal. Uh, given the signal, players choose a strategy and a distribution of signals is a correlated equilibrium. If given the signal, the players do, let's say what the signal tells them to do. And similarly, an epsilon correlated equilibrium. And traffic lights and market prices are, are some of the examples of that. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about markets. So markets with prices are much simpler than markets without prices. So a market with a posted price, first of all, it induces truthful responses by market participants. So if you go to a supermarket and you see uh, 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 prices, uh, there is no reason for you to misrepresent your preferences. And moreover, computationally, it's a simple strategy. It's given those prices, find the optimal uh, bundle of goods that would make you happiest given your money constraints and value for money. So it's a very simple strategy and uh, a truthful response. It's a correlated equilibrium because you need those prices. And without those prices, actually, uh, participants will need to start haggling, negotiating prices, trying to influence the outcome by misreporting their utilities. And the game becomes very complicated even with one item. So for example, there is a famous theorem from the 80s saying that, uh, called the uh, myerson satterthwaite no trade theorem that basically says that if you are simultaneously trying to negotiate the price and figure out whether you should even trade at all, Sometimes the trade will fail because basically sometimes uh, the wrong outcome will happen. Uh, sometimes they'll negotiate themselves into a situation where uh, they'll have to call each other's bluffs and sale, no sale will happen even though it should have happened. Even though there is a price at which they want to trade, they'll have to not trade to, to kind of make it a credible threat that they want to hold their price. Um, so in a large market, this is not such a big distinction. So, in, uh, so for example, if you're thinking about oil prices and you're not OPEC, your behavior at the gas station does not affect world uh, gas prices. So correlated equilibrium. So, okay, so this is one reason algorithmically they're nicer. They're also, if you never he heard of game theory and let's say you're an engineer trying to, to build some system, you'll probably arrive at the correlated equilibrium because, uh, okay, faced with a game, you'll just write a bunch of bots to play this game. And when bots play with each other, they arrive at the correlated equilibrium. That's roughly speaking, low regret, which is the right notion of playing well, corresponds to, to a correlated equilibrium. Formally, you need a slightly stronger notion of swap regret. So for any function, taking one action to another action, you get a negligible benefit. Every time I played A, I'd play B instead, a sigma instead, I still cannot benefit. And this is attainable kind of uh, in this uh, low regret online learning literature. And so correlated equilibria are tractable pretty much in any reasonable notion. So if you have a matrix, you can compute a uh, correlated equilibrium. You can also compute it with a linear program. But uh, whenever you can do online learning, you can, you can find the correlated equilibrium. So it's a reduction that works. And generally speaking, online learning is easy within kind of anything that's not precluded by information theoretic reasons uh, or by computational, hard computational reasons is possible. And uh, often it's, it's a version of gradient descent, which is nice because this is the algorithm that people use even for problems where we don't really understand. So it, it extends nicely to heuristic settings. So if, even if a bunch of bots are playing a game that's too complicated to solve, what they get is arguably a correlated equilibrium. Uh, so a final ingredient is relatively new. So, uh, it's probably new if, unless you're in one of these areas, it's, you've probably never seen it before. 
uh, bandits with knapsacks, it's an extension of the bandits model. So in a standard bandit or expert setting, there are n arms, t rounds, and you pull an arm j at time t, and you get the reward rjt. And the goal, so this is model uh, online learning, uh, among other things, the total reward from actions is the sum of rewards over rounds. And it has good regret, epsilon regret, if the best action in hindsight uh, would have gotten you at most epsilon more than uh, what you actually attained. And uh, epsilon swap regret is the same, except instead of for all A, you, you look at for all permutations, and this is still attainable. Um, of course, here uh, you, you have more strategies to compete with, so the symptotics are a little worse, but basically you can, if, if I remember correctly, in all of this you can get to whatever information theoretically optimal you can do. So for example, you, you'll have some regrets. So for example, if you're trying to predict a sequence of coins and you're competing with two strategies, you'll have to have a regret of root t because the better, so it, if you have two monkeys predicting the stock market, the better of the two monkeys will actually make the money and you won't in expectation. So uh, if you're using, I mean, let's say you're trying to predict a random process, so you'll have to have regret root T, but um, and it's a, basically you can get to whatever information theoretically optimal. With knapsacks, there is an additional twist. There is a capacity cost C, uh, which is revealed after you pull an arm. Let's say it's it's relatively small to the budget. So in addition to the reward, you also learn how much it costs. So think about it as you pick a bunch of rocks, you pick a rock, you learn how heavy it is and uh, how valuable it is. And then you put it in your knapsack and you have a budget B in your knapsack. And you assume that there is always a zero, the option of get zero cost, zero reward. And you're competing with some policies and you want an absolute regret. And unfortunately, here there is an information, simple information theoretic or knowledge obstacle. So imagine the universe selects randomly between two possible worlds, S1 and S2. So in both of them, the cost is two per round, so you can afford to get half the rocks. In the first one, for the first two over two period, in both of them, for the first two over two periods, every rock is worth $1. And then in the second half, every rock will either be worth $0 or $2. So you're getting silver coins and then you're getting uh, uh, rocks or gold coins. So you'll have regret no matter what, because right? So if you decide to, to get those, you'll have uh, linear regret here. If you decide to wait, you'll have linear regret in this world. So it's unavoidable. It turns out that the obstacle is actually a one parameter obstacle. So if you needed, so you could, if you could know one number, you could actually get negligible regret of in here, which is the target bank per buck. So if someone told you that by when it's done, the best strategy in hindsight has bank per buck R, so the ratio between units of weight and units of dollars is, is, is something, then you can replace actually reward and cost by, by this linear expression and run standard low regret algorithms and get all, all the wonderful results from standard optimization. So it's a one parameter, it's, even though it's an evil problem, it's a one parameter evil problem. So that's something to keep in mind, but it is an evil problem. So, okay, so let's review the ingredients because there are a few of them. Hopefully you've seen some of them before, but there are still a lot of them. Uh, so we have the VCG, which seamlessly converts optimization to mechanisms, but it requires money and it's very kind of sensitive to imperfections in, in the optimization. So it's not very robust. We have this generic kind of sense that online low regret learning is good for get, is, is probably the way to get equilibria. So if we had computers when we started studying game theory, this would be probably the default way of thinking about equilibrium. And bandits with knapsacks are potentially useful up to a single global parameter per player. They're actually easy. Okay, so let's put this together. 
Uh, so we are now uh, trying, here's the problem we are trying to solve. Each player submits a utility function FI, and the goal is to find, uh, to aggregate all the FIs into a good global outcome such that at least in high, at least in some sense, uh, submitting the true FI is a good strategy for play, right? And the goal is to do it without money, but still be good, be optimal in some sense. Okay, so here is, uh, let's, uh, let's imagine a miracle happened. So there is no money involved. Each player submits a utility function. Suppose we gave everyone B tokens. Those are not money. So the, in VCG, it's important that people actually have residual value for the money. They care if they have money in the end, how much money they have in the end. But let's say we gave them tokens that are not real money, but they're not allowed to exceed. So they can participate in this mechanism, but they cannot spend more than B units of money. Let's say we maximize the utility charge VCG prices fully knowing that those are not, this is not real money. But suppose magically it, it came out that every player owes us ex exactly B tokens. So it's not real money. We don't get to use truthfulness of VCG as is, but suppose that happened. Then we immediately get the correlated equilibrium because if you freeze everyone else, by truthfulness of VCG, even though it's not real money, you cannot simultaneously spend at most B and improve your utility. Even, this is true even though uh, it, it doesn't matter here that B, because you're at your budget, it doesn't matter that B is not, the tokens are not real because in, it said, a VCG tells you, the truthfulness of the original VCG said, tells you that you cannot simultaneously spend less money and get a better outcome. So freezing everyone else, it's a dominant strategy to report the fight. It's a correlated equilibrium. Uh, okay, so that's, that seems promising. Okay, next. So here is an annoying or a fun fact. In, in the case without money, uh, FIs are unitless. There is no canonical scaling. Sometimes there is, like in voting with two alternatives, it seems to make sense that you have to scale everyone to plus minus one. You could argue that even that is a bug in the system, but uh, that you don't ask people how much they care about the vote when they vote. But that's actually a feature of the fact that without money, there is no way to normalize preferences. You have to trade off, I care a lot or I care a little, doesn't make sense unless you have at least two different things to, to choose from. Basically, uh, it doesn't make sense unless there is some external option to, to, to use as, as measurement. So all that files anyway only makes sense up to a scaling factor. So let's repeat the scenario from the previous slide. Give everyone B tokens. Let's say we came up with some non-negative lambdas. And instead of FI wrote this, charge VCG prices. And suppose we have lambda such that everyone is charged B. By the exact same analysis, it is still true that if I freeze all the Fs and I freeze lambda I, FI prime cannot get player I better utility than FI. So I still get a correlated equilibrium. Now this looks less far-fetched because somehow the, it would take immense luck for everyone to pick exactly B, but now with one parameter per player, it looks like if I set lambda to zero, your externality will be zero. If I set it to infinity, presumably you'll have a large externality, unless you actually can be made infinitely happy without inconvenience in everyone else, in which case it's fine also. So this, this, there is always that exception. Um, but uh, this seems not far-fetched, and those can be learned. So this is kind of the main uh, algorithm in this paper, adaptive pricing, equalizing externalities. So basically, this is the proposed algorithm. You run an iterated optimization loop where you learn, so instead of lambda, you have lambda IT times FI plus, plus a regularizer. You put it inside an optimization loop and charge each player in tokens. 
and you charge local BCG prices. So think about your favorite gradient descent algorithm. One way to think about it is actually, wait, okay, one, then kind of the way it's run in practice, it's you, you just run it with some learning rate. But you can make it a little more formal by adding a quadratic regularizer such that it's actually doing this at a step is actually the local optimum is that regularizer. This is a very easy problem because locally it's just a quadratic function. Yeah. So what's the point of regularizer? Um, it's potential. You don't have to use it, but potentially this with regularizer it already captures the majority of uh, iterated optimization heuristics. So that's uh, this and it fits, this it, the, the, yeah. The goal is to fit it. We'll see an example where it actually helps beyond that, even for game theory reasons. You're saying when you said charge local VC prices, so that I guess what you mean by that is you're going to solve this by some. Yeah, it, locally it's it's usually a very simple convex optimization. I mean, it's so simple that usually you don't actually solve it. You just declare that at a times gradient is the solution, but it's not. It's it's actually an easy. Is uh, the local VCG prices or some linear transformation using the Hessian or something? We will we'll see a formula, but uh, you charge. So you, uh, X moves locally. You can compute how much inconvenience every player causes to other players and also to the regularizer. So the regularizer usually doesn't want to move. So they move because the players want to move. And you can also convert that into prices, but Basically, that you charge local VCG prices, and you let every player so they have a budget. So you let them adjust the lambdas using bandwidth with Napster. So looking at it from the perspective of individual players, you get to submit the lambda. Uh, the war, the universe responds with moving in the direction that you like or don't like, and also how much externality it charges you. Uh, so your game is a bandwidth with Napster game. From individual players, um, so this is uh, so what we got is a reduction to uh, for generic iterated optimization. So given some local heuristic for maximizing FT, the heuristic consists of a sequence of steps. At each step, the heuristic adds a regularizer and maximizes the a current objective function plus regularizer around xt to obtain xt plus one. Uh, so this is just, this is all we need. And the only requirement is that the local optimization is simple and not crazy, that basically the VCG prices make sense. And th this is true in the generic kind of case, usually you either have or can add a local quadratic. Uh, to make it true, so and yeah, so basically, it's uh, this is the heuristic, uh, just um, uh, uh, restating it. So here is the main equilibrium result. So if this algorithm, so it's all if uh, we don't know that it converges, and it seems like there are some obstacles to it converging in general, like PPAD hardness, but if it converges. To a solution where each player has low regret, then you get something called the correlated equilibrium from equal endowments, which is uh, uh, something that's uh, pretty well studied. Uh, in particular, if you freeze everything, it is no player benefits from misreporting their type. And we'll see, uh, we'll see examples of this. Why is this correlated? Well, because we need to freeze the entire execution. So your FI, so if, if you freeze everything else, then your, your FI, locally you're facing VCG prices, point-wise VCG prices. So the output is a distribution and we look at the trajectory. At every point of the trajectory, we pretend what would have happened if you, play, if you reported something else, but we freeze the trajectory. Of course, it's it's only correlated and not an actual general equilibrium because if you reported something else, maybe the trajectory would have been completely different. This these are potentially very complicated chaotic systems. So of course, globally, 
it's possible that you would have uh, caused the outcome to be completely different, and we cannot control for that. Uh, so all we can promise is a correlated equilibrium that freezes the game and exposes everyone to price, uh, says this is the outcome, this is why, and this is the local sensitivity from, if you change your FI, this is what will, the outcome will be, and that gives you an equilibrium. This is kind of, if it looks not convincing, this is what the market prices are, right? So market prices also, they tell you those are the prices, and those prices the market seem to more or less clear, and uh, subject to those prices, people actually and companies are best responding, but there is no claim that you couldn't have that without those prices, if you had to renegotiate, you'd get the same prices again. So here is a simple example. This is the simplest example. There are two items and two players. So the players like getting the item and don't like not getting it. Right, so player one likes outcome. Uh, much more sensitive players, so they have value 10 for getting it. You give each team budget for each player, and the game is just a repeated. What is BCG? It's a repeated second price auction. So they learn lambda one and lambda two, and if 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 everything is set up properly, the prices will fluctuate around two. So it will cost roughly two to get the item at every period, so that every player wins half the time and pays around two when, when they win. And so uh, you'll recover the, even, the equal allocation. So that's if the price goes above two, then it's unwise to try to win the auction. If the price drops below, well below two, then it's wise to try to win the auction. And so the price will fluctuate around two. I'll say more about this case, but and uh, yeah, so you can also do the same thing. You you can literally compute the infin infinitesimal prices. As I said, it's a linear, it's a quadratic function locally. Everything like uh, yeah, so uh, which is nice because it says that if you want, it's it's similar to quadratic voting. If you want to to, to double your impact, you have to quadruple your your price for that. Uh, so the three major applications, as I mentioned, is voting, one-sided location, and two-sided location. So let me say something about all three. So in voting, the goal, okay, so this is very ambitious goal, but to aggregate cardinal preferences. And it only makes sense with three players, with three outcomes or more, because with two outcomes, literally, there is really nothing you can do except up and down uh, majority. So you want truthfulness, also efficiency, and there are a lot of negative results, but okay, so, but why do we want to think about cardinal as examples like this? So in this example, uh, things like, I mean, so, so, some runoff versions will get de-elected, but the simplest ones were the top two vote getters advance to the to, to a runoff actually will get one of ABC elected where it's kind of clear that D is the best alternative here. And it seems impossibly hard. It's you can't even get truthful elections with ordinal preferences. So uh, and there are imposs impossibility results here, but okay, you can pretend like you've never heard of them and just plug it into the framework. So X here is the simplex, distributions over K alternatives. And you, so you have to add the regularizer because you want basically, it's a simplex, it's bounded, you cannot give negative weight to alternatives. So you have to have some kind of regularizer that tells you that it, it, it will take infinitely many votes to, to bring something below zero. Uh, and what you get locally is, uh, an equilibrium with quadratic prices. So here's a picture. And the main challenge actually, so if, if you're into voting, that's, that's an actual challenge. So somehow intuitively, I think it's a good scheme, but there are, I'm not sure how would you, what are the benchmarks? Because there are no truthful schemes. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's, uh, 
it remains kind of, it's probably not good for human voting because it's a gradient descent, but it's probably very good for for kind of aggregating multiple algorithms or concerns or machines or, uh, but you need to aggregate with equal votes, which is, it seems like a useful function to have, but uh, I don't know that there are good bench benchmarks. So the picture is something like this. So you, you could have multiple equilibria and in a given equilibrium, basically every player this is the kind of this is what one vote buys you if, if we are here because the barrier is more aggressive in this direction you can either influence so, uh, a little bit along this axis or along a lot along this axis this is what one vote buys you and when you aggregate the, all the votes you get negative uh, gradient of the regularizer. So when you aggregate all of them, they're indifferent between A and B and strongly prefer C to not get elected. So, so that's why you get, uh, so that's an equilibrium. So you literally tell everyone, this is the outcome. This is what the vote buys you. And when you aggregate, you arrive at the same point. So here, and so next let's talk about one-sided allocation. This is the one case where we can actually prove new results in the sense that uh, there is enough prior literature to improve upon. Uh, so n players and items. So school choice is the canonical example. Also course allocation where there are oversubscribed courses and you need to resort to lotteries. So each player wants one item. They have a utility matrix UIJ and the outcome space is bistochastic matrices. So it's a, it's uh, you want to assign each player with the probability of winning an item. Uh, the previous uh, the two item one item two players is an example of that where the utilities are one for uh, it's a diagonal matrix. So you have utility one for getting the item and utility zero. We invent a second empty item which nobody, everyone has utility zero for. So there is an old uh, uh, classical result by Heidel Zeckhauser about 40 years ago that says that there are prices PJ on items such that you can give everyone uh, tokens, let's say one, talk, one unit of uh, virtual currency, and that those prices, everyone buys their favorite bundle and the market clears. So, uh, so that's the equilibrium result. And it's used, uh, it's proved using fixed point theory and it's pretty hard in general, at least to find an exact, uh, which is, it's, it's, it's inconvenient. Uh, but yeah, it's computationally hard at least to find an exact equilibrium. We don't know how robust this result with respect to epsilon equilibrium. In particular, it's not, I'm not convinced that it rules out practical heuristics. Uh, yeah, so the difficulty of approximating highland zeckhauser equilibrium is still open. Okay, so we can plug the problem into, into this Apex framework and obtain a new result. So here is the new result. There are, so given those utilities, there are scaling factors lambda i such that uh, the highland, there are highland zeckhauser prices that are the result of running VCG unit demand auction on those scaled prices. So there is a very, so in a, in a setting where there are N players with money, N players, N items, uh, and every player is unit demand, they want exactly one item. There is a very simple instance of VCG and it's very well studied and very well understood. It basically, uh, it's, 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 it's the, in combinatorics, it's called the Hungarian algorithm. It's basically the thing that you think works will work. Keep raising prices. If, if an item is oversubscribed, raise its prices a little bit and stop when this stops happening. This works. Pretty much anything. It's a very well understood, uh, very nice setup. And it turns out that, again, up to this one parameter of scaling utilities properly, you can get this equilibrium that was a bit magical from this very simple option. Uh, so there is an execution of VCG with those scaled utilities where one of two things happens. Everyone either spends exactly one unit of budget like in that. So basically it's an existent result for this general state 
statement from before. You can scale such that everyone pays exactly one, or there is this exception spends less than one unit because they're infinitely happy as it is. Right. So if two people want cars and one person wants sun sunshine, they'll pay zero and be maximally happy. Um, and it's actually a proper characterization. Some age, uh, some prices are not VCG prices. So here is an example of that. So there are four players and four items, and those are their utilities. So players three and four only want item C. Players one and two want C, then A, then B. Nobody wants D. So this allocation, so you you split items A and B between the first two players and C and D between the second two players. Uh, and those are the prices. So C costs two, A costs 1.1, B costs 0 0.9. This is a Highland Zeckhauser competitive equilibrium. So if you think about it, three and four, all they can do is buy as much C as possible. And one and two, they would like to spend money on C, but then they won't have money to buy. They, yeah, basically, because B costs 0 0.9 it, and they actually want B, it, it, it eats their budget and makes them ineligible to try to buy C. But it's not supported by any VCG prices because under VCG, item B is not oversubscribed. So imagine a dynamics where they actually, you keep raising prices, you'll never have to raise the price of B because only two people are interested in A and B and they prefer A to B. So in our situation, U1 and U2 will want, both want B. So B should cost zero. That's a kind of, in VCG, you cannot charge for something that's not oversubscribed. So this is point nine. It's just a way to exploit the first two players by forcing them to pay some for something that only they want, but that otherwise should be free. And indeed, there is a different equilibrium where B costs zero. So players, uh, the first two players also get a little bit of item C now because they have some disposable income now to, to spend on C. And uh, this is the equilibrium supported by VCG prices. This and uh, this is some scale. And so you spend the first two players by four, seven, the third and four by two, seven. And you run VCG, you see that everyone will have to spend exactly one unit at, at those prices. Okay. And, uh, okay, so the theorem we get, okay, so in one direction, there exist uh, apex solutions that lead to a, to a highland Zeckhauser equilibrium. In the opposite direction, not every low regret execution corresponds to a VCG highland Zeckhauser equilibrium. But if you add a reasonable regularizer, it becomes an epsilon VCG HZ equilibrium. And the regularizer here is some small concave function, function that's added to the objective. And it seems to be important. So somehow, even though it's a completely kind of combinatorial setup, you get to recover those things somehow. So what goes wrong without regularization? Let's go back to the example with two players and one item. Essentially, A is an item and B is not an item. So here is a, an execution of Apex that technically is valid if you, if you don't do any regularization. So then every step just runs a second price auction. So here what happens is that every third step, player two wins and pays three. And uh, at other times, player one wins and pays one and a half. So it implies an allocation where P1 gets a with probability two thirds and P2 gets one third. And this is not supported by any prices. There is no way to price A to cause anything except for a 50 50 split here. So, what goes wrong? Well, the no regret is not very convincing here. There is no regret because kind of it's hopeless, right? So, player one is happy and player two has no reason. Like if I was player two, I wouldn't leave it at one and a half, right? So I would try to punish player one. But technically it's a weak equilibrium. And once you add a regularization term, it's actually the solution above stops being a low regret solution because the concavity of the regularizer will force player two to not bid like this, to bid close to. So two bids that are far apart are worse than some kind of mean between them. 
So this will stop being a low regret, and then all low regret executions become good. Uh, okay, so let me say something uh, about two-sided matching. It's mainly open problems at this point. So the vast majority of work on two-sided matching is without it focuses on ordinal settings, so no cardinal preferences, and focuses on stability instead of so stability. You'd think that it solves everything, but it's actually it might be extremely inefficient, right? So just because something's stable doesn't mean that it's efficient. Um, and in part because it seems impossibly difficult to, to approach it. It's already bad enough with one sided, two sided is worse. So the previous whole discussion, which is very is quite deep, is a special case where the items have no preferences over who gets them. So this is at least as, as, as bad. So it's possible to, to get meaningful result by just plugging into the framework, but you get into conceptual difficulties very quickly. So how do you even define externality in a two-party match? And it's already a, an ideological question because here's an example. Uh, there are two hospitals and two doctors and everyone agrees that H1 is better and everyone agrees that D1 is better. So D1 is popular and H1 is popular. Uh, what is externality? So externality is utility without D1 minus utility with D1, and you want to equalize it somehow. Do you include the positive utility? So without D1 means D1 disappears, or D1 shows up but doesn't opine about what should happen. And this is kind of like the difference between socialism and uh, and uh, extreme capitalism in, 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 in one simple definition. Because uh, so who does the external the positive externality of existing accrues to the commons or or the one? And depending on that, if 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 to her, then the best matching is the stable one. So D1 should get the better hospital, and the better hospital should get D1. And if to the commons, then the, you get the uniform outcome. Right, because the universe doesn't care. The universe is equally happy with all the all the matchings are equally good for the universe. Like the total utility is going to be 30, no matter what. And uh, so it becomes somewhat normative. <clears throat> okay, so, but I think there is still kind of, uh, it's, it's probably possible to make a lot of progress uh, compared to what's known now about two-sided matching by, by just carefully analyzing uh, the way we did it for one-sided matching. So there are some new problems. So everything we discuss is kind of one shot, but uh, right. So we assume that F5 is written, and but it's actually easy, very easy to extend it to an online setting where FIs are actually changing over time, like in reinforcement learning, or let's say we are running a server farm and FIs, or even within one processor, and FIs some resource allocation. So my demand function changes over time. But it's very easy to interleave that kind of uh, that that kind of process with with this framework, uh, and also we all we need really is a gradient oracle for FI, which is unusual. So it, uh, so that should be a plus in many settings uh, because yeah we don't need any complicated global knowledge. Uh, so directions in terms of theory development, besides kind of trying it, and uh, I hope to be able to develop a cookbook for converting actual modern algorithms into mechanisms uh, without kind of you without making so basically the goal is it's a dangerous goal. So the goal is to not make any assumptions and have something that should work out of the box. Of course, since we are dealing with hypotheticals, it's more you can just do what people in machine learning do and say it works because you have to kind of work, worry about what the best response will be. But the hope will, would be that at least locally, it gives you ni nice enough stability result that you, it works better than the current solutions that usually don't make, uh, don't bake in uh, incentives or are very restrictive in their assumptions. So the ML theory question here is, what does it, let's say FIs are uh, 
think about uh, empirical uh, loss minimization and FIs are scoring functions for particular examples, for example. What does it mean? What is the interpretation of equalizing externalities? Does it make sense? So what does it mean to take a one person, one vote about labels of examples? And when is it useful as, as a function? Because currently, most of the time, the weights that different examples have are somewhat ad hoc. So, uh, so it may be for robustness or maybe when you need to explicitly make trade-offs of some kind. Uh, the optimization question, the biggest one is, can the main loop be replaced with direct optimization? So the standard bandits, not with knapsacks, Correlated equilibrium, let's say I give you a matrix and ask you to come up with a correlated equilibrium. Uh, you can write a linear program that does the same. It's not as fun, but you can write a linear program that does whatever you could get with uh, uh, low regret learning. Uh, is it true here? Uh, or some kind of direct optimization? It's not going to be convex, but... and. Uh, kind of a more open-ended question, but perhaps even more important is, is, okay, is this the best we can do? And if so, what kind of equilibrium notion do we get? Right? So at some point, let's say you wanted to solve Nash, but you kind of, you wrote a bunch of bots and got a correlated Nash. At some point, you, you, it's reasonable to say, okay, this is what we can get, let's call it a definition. So let's say we can we cannot get to a correlated equilibrium because the lambdas do not converge. Is there a weaker notion that we can actually guarantee to always exist, but that still makes sense? So that's a potentially a missing definition here, and uh, it's kind of more open-ended uh, question. Thank you. Questions? Zoom. I'll ask you a question. So, can you say again a little bit more about the Bayesian question you had about the externalities? Yes. Yeah, so, is there so typically when you aggregate things in general, let's say you have a bunch of examples and you need to train a model on them. Are you thinking of like a scenario where you have different samples from like different hospitals and you're trying to? Yeah, or any, any kind of, you're running a linear regression. You have a bunch of, uh, you have a latent variable you try to learn. You have a bunch of examples and you're trying to learn uh, to train a model. So, so you're doing some aggregation. Sometimes it's an explicitly Bayesian aggregation. So you're trying to find the best likelihood parameter to explain, um, to explain the data. Uh, so kind of more extreme data in that case will definitely get much more weight in your... Oh, so the F I is a... I missed... But I thought the Fs were a function of the whole sample set. Really no, Fs here, no. F here would be one example. Oh, I see. So in voting, right? So we don't say what we are aggregating. So if you are aggregating knowledge, let's say every one of us measures something, and we have measures uh, kind of temperature in their backyard and we are aggregating it. Uh, so if you do a least square aggregation, then extreme measurements will get more weight. And uh, if you're doing Bayesian, right, and you assume that everyone is honest, obviously, uh, or you will have some model that drops out, drops out very extreme data points. So if everyone says it's 40 this morning and I say it was 70, you might disregard this data, so that would no longer be Bayesian. Or you could take median, which would, which would be more closely corresponding to one person, one vote. So kind of in sports competitions, that's one reason to do a median to kind of prevent manipulation. But um, OK, so it makes for one, for one dimensional data, you can just say that median is, is kind of the one person, one vote analog. What happens if we need to agree on a point in space? What, what is the principled kind of definition of, I have a bunch of pretty simple functions and I'm aggregating them in a one person, one vote fashion. Uh, so that's, it's, it's a definition. It's both a definition question and, 
what it's good for. <laughs> but what's the analog of so one person one vote for for one dimensional data is median. Like that's how you would aggregate Olympics, for example, Olympic scoring for that reason. Sometimes they do something else, but what is the one person one vote for complex decision making? Or for complex learning? That's the question. Yeah. Hey, sorry, what is the uh, what are the preferences of the analog of the preferences in the in the ML theory question? So probably is a regret loss of the model on my data point. Sure, but what are the agent preferences that are being reported, or are we like? So it's not uh, it's not as much agent preferences here. It's I get a bunch of data and I want to give each point equal weight in some sense. Sure. So that's uh, you could. Think about it as each point actually has a model in mind. So I want the outcome to be very warm. So I'll report 80 if it helps. And you want to limit the impact of that. So that's why I wrote robustness. So there is a, a lot of literature on robustness, but so potentially it should be more robust. Like data poisoning? Yeah, for example. It's, it might neither be necessary nor sufficient, but it seems like voting is a useful primitive, and it, it's good to have it for data aggregation. We, we never resolve what voting means, even in kind of society, right? So it's, it's not information aggregation. It's not really preference aggregation, but it's useful. Uh, and it seems like a useful primitive to have, at least kind of... Uh, at least mathematically and probably then I expect that there will be some scenarios where it works better than the alternatives in practice and uh, the, the philosophy of it might never be fully resolved. Wait, quick follow up, Do you, is there like a state of the art in terms of like robustness for this kind of data poisoning scenario? It's a, it's a, it's a very rapidly moving area, so I don't know, I mean, uh, also there you have to really be yeah, the threat models are kind of very variable. Right. Thanks again. Thank you.